In a context of increasing efforts to decarbonize supply chains, emerging economies are at risk of being left behind due to a lack of green infrastructure. How can emerging economies harness frontier technologies to support supply chain decarbonization and ensure the sustainable movement of goods? World Insight with Tian Wei brings you a panel at this year's World Economic Forum, Decarbonizing Supply Chains leaving no one behind. Joining us, we have Ngozi Okonjo Iwela, the Director General of the World Trade Organization. Helen Mountford, Chief Executive Officer at the Climate Works Foundation. Jacques van der Meeren, Chief Executive Officer at the Port of Antwerp and Bruges. Jose Alejandro Rojas Pardini, the Minister of Private Investments at the Ministry of the Presidency of Panama, and Nicholas Martinson, Chief Executive Officer at the Stena Line AB. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tian Wei. It's wonderful to be back in Davos for the World Economic Forum. And our session is about decarbonizing supply chains, leaving no one behind. The reason we are discussing it today is we all know there is a shared goal for all of us for decarbonization. And yet, the supply chain could be a very critical, important component of it. And I'm very honored to share with you is that we have a wonderful opening speech coming from someone who care about the topic that we are talking about today. Ngozi Okonjo Ivela, Director General of the World Trade Organization. So good to see you. Thank you. Too. It's so nice to be here. And what a, this is a really important uh, topic. I don't normally read speeches. Those who know me know that. <laughs> but today I'm going to read a speech because some of these messages are so important. I want to make sure I get them all out. So bear with me. Um, we know that uh, trade and supply chains are essential for scaling up the production and diffusion of the green technologies that are necessary to ensure sustainable growth free from carbon pollution. Last year's edition of the WTO's flagship World Trade Report, which we launched during COP27 in Sharm El Sheikh, had a clear message. Trade is the missing piece of the climate puzzle. Trade is part of the solution. Supply chain decarbonization presents real risks for developing countries. They will need to have the capacity and infrastructure to demonstrate the low carbon content of their goods and services. Some have export <laughs> baskets that are currently tilted heavily towards high carbon goods. At the same time, there are also immense opportunities for developing countries to leapfrog and avoid locking in trillions of dollars in high carbon productive and supply chain infrastructure. So we have a duty to ensure that everyone everywhere can participate in a low carbon global economy. For this, we need a renewed and revamped kind of globalization and multilateral trade cooperation. Let me spell out a few potential areas for action. One deals with the traditional bread and butter of trade policy, namely market, market access barriers. Evidence shows that tariffs are often skewed in favor of high carbon products, with import duties higher on greener goods. I've been calling on WTO members to resume efforts to liberalize trade in environmental goods and services, bearing in mind all the sensitivities of developing countries who may want to do some manufacturing of these goods, and some developed countries who are very sensitive on where the benefits of such liberalization are concentrated. But we need to move on it. Another area deals with carbon pricing, where we already see about 70 different fragmented schemes with varying prices, scopes, and ambitions, leading to uncertainty, competitiveness concerns, and fears of disruptive unilateral action. 
I remain convinced that a shared global pricing framework would best provide certainty for businesses and predictability for developing countries. A third area is standards and regulatory issues, where once again fragmentation will only complicate matters and increase costs for companies everywhere, but especially in developing countries. To decarbonize supply chains, we will need to get into the nuts and bolts of each sector to reach shared understandings about how to calculate and certify carbon footprints and develop appropriate international standards. Finally, the low carbon globalization we are seeking to foster must not continue the shortcomings of the global economy as it has evolved up until now, let alone make them worse. We can build a greener, more resilient, a more inclusive global economy by bringing people and countries currently on the margins of supply networks into new low carbon value chains. And by helping developing countries with high carbon export baskets to diversify, bringing more women owned businesses and micro, small and medium enterprises into green supply chains would also help build resilience for the world, while at the same time, including those who have been left out. This is a big agenda but I know we can do it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Now, Mr. Minister, you are coming from the government, and we see uh, Madam Director General pointing out several things. Technology, funding, standards, and uh, lack of some of the resiliency issues. So what do you see is the biggest challenge to you and your country as a developing country? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, honored to be here. Uh, I think that that is the, the biggest challenge is that there's a big difference between developed and, and underdeveloped countries um, regarding what are the resources and how we can make a global, because the complexities is that you have to kind of make almost at the same time wh whatever solution we, we go into. Mm. I'll give you an example. When uh, the Panama Canal was expanded and when th that decision was made, uh, it took around um, six, seven years of doing roadshows. Mm -hmm. uh, and when those roadshows were being done, you had to get the different ports, specifically the ports in the United States on the Atlantic side, that they would buy into it. Because what would it work? It wouldn't have worked if you expand the canal and then you wouldn't have the use for it on, on, on the Atlantic side. Uh, so examples, you know, Port of Houston and uh, also in, in Miami, many, many ports that had to go through, uh, th through dredging and, and through expansions. Part of the situation here is that we have to all move kind of at the same time. It, 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 it's very hard if we're going to be moving at different times. So we need to find ways of, of doing it. We first had IMO 2020. And then it changed to IMO 2030. Still, the world hasn't decided where we're going to go. Are we going to go to biomethanol? Are we going to go to mm. natural gas? You know, which way we're headed. What we're trying to do is to find other complementary uses so that we build the infrastructure not being sure completely of where we're headed mm. because mm -hmm. no one, you know, we haven't all got into an agreement of where we're headed. So I'll give you examples. We have in the Panama Canal, inside the Panama Canal, we have a, a billion dollar natural gas facility yeah. um, in case that we're headed that way. We, it started because it was more for energy for having firm capacity, but understanding that uh, there could be the opportunity there to expand for, for shipping if that would be the case. And now we're increasing the capacity and, and we're having a $1.2 billion a investment also mm. next to it on natural gas. Mm. Uh, but uh, since governments, we believe either that governments really have to create the conditions and the public policy so uh, and, and have the, the private sector making these investments, in some cases public-private, like the $1.2 billion project I just talked about, that it's yeah. Panama has 25% of, of, of the shares. But we are also trying a uh, pushing for there's a, a private group in, in which involves Goldman Sachs, Fluor, um, different companies. Uh, I see. Uh, and, and they're pushing for 
a $7 billion a biorefinery and looking at also producing a green hydrogen. So mm -hmm. we, don't, we are not completely sure where we're headed, but we want to, in advance, try to push understanding that you cannot build something only for a purpose because until we have clarity of, of where we're going to head both ways or three ways or only one, uh, so we're trying just to prepare and, and create mm -hmm. the conditions so that the public sec private sector can help us. But if we're having that problem, I could imagine that there's many other places who share the same who have or similar or, or even bigger challenges. I see. That's a great point because it's very pragmatic. A, a consensus about timetable and a consensus of uh, shared goals, uh, and also consensus about technologies and methods. Uh, on that, I want to go to Helen, because you have been working with your partners, Philanthropies, for example, to work on these uh, decarbonizing projects, particularly in emerging and developing countries. So how are you figuring that out? You know, some of the problems that uh, Mr. Minister frankly pointed out about lacking consensus of at this point. Thanks very much. It is, it's definitely a challenge. And one of the things we're looking at is not just as, as Ngozi so eloquently put, yeah. um, explained the whole challenge around decarbonizing supply chains, getting products moving, and how trade can play a role in that, but actually how do we transport those goods? Um, and so we're working together with philanthropy, with partners on the ground in multiple countries around the world on how can we actually help to decarbonize shipping, how can we help to decarbonize trucking, um, and move move that forward. And so just one example I can give from, from trucking, um, something very exciting that we launched as part of the Drive Electric campaign just last November. We launched a new, um, a new initiative, a new fund called LEAP, which is leapfrogging to e-mobility acceleration partnership. So trying to do the leapfrogging that was mentioned before by Ngozi. Um, and we're working with 10 countries. Um, we've got Brazil, Burundi, Chile, Colombia, Kenya, Nigeria, Paraguay, Philippines, South Africa, and Uganda. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing with each of those is pilot testing approaches on the ground on how to leapfrog to e-mobility. Um, similarly, in shipping, there's a lot to be done. There's, there's also massive opportunities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm glad because you addressed some of the earlier concerns that Mr. Minister just mentioned, which is we do not know what is the best way. And therefore, we have the pilot projects. Yeah to show what might be the best way. There are two uh, wonderful gentlemen sitting here coming from the business community. You have to know what you're doing uh, because it's a business that you're running. There are bottom lines of business uh, about creating values, for example, for your shareholders and the public. So when you know there are uncertainties, yet there are shared goals, what are you doing? How do you test and pilot, and probably even have some good examples already that you can share here today. Jacques? Well, uh, pioneering together, if mm -hmm. I can resume the whole thing or the whole approach. So uh, we have to move from uh, fossil fuels to uh, renewable ones. So green molecules, green electrons, that's the future. Mm -hmm. So we will have to collaborate and to cooperate, especially in looking at the shipping industry, and Nicholas will confirm uh, in, in, in a minute uh, the approach of, of uh, shipping companies. But of course, the decarbonization of the shipping industry will happen on sea or in the, in the waters, but also on land, because we will have to bunker if uh, Nicholas believes in, for instance, green ammonia or green methanol as the future uh, uh, fuel for, for his uh, ships, well, a ship uh, sails from, from port to port. Then we need infrastructure yeah. in those ports and in every port, not only in the developed countries, but also in the other one. So you, you need a collective approach and we need uh, yeah, solutions that will be figured out by a community. And that's uh, the wonderful thing here in, uh, in Davos. We have a governance meeting regrouping all the big
big actors or main actors of the supply chain. Yeah. And we think in solutions for the, for the future with shipping companies, but also with, with ports and, and with the forward. So, so what are you doing right now? Well, we are uh, uh, currently, the, the no-brain approach is infrastructure. We have to build uh, uh, the, the, the terminals, the pipelines, the storage capacity. For Give us the, an, for a few examples that you think you would love to work uh, uh, with uh, Nicolas? Well, uh, if, if, we, if Nicolas uh, uh, wants to uh, use uh, green, uh, green ammonia, uh, that green ammonia will have to be produced somewhere. And, and the interesting thing here is for uh, producing green ammonia, you need lots of wind and sun and space. And uh, uh, we have that on Earth, not uh, especially in, uh, in, in Europe, but maybe you have them in Namibia or in Chile or in Australia mm -hmm. or in Egypt or in Morocco or in Oman. And so we can invest because we will need huge volumes of green ammonia or green methanol. So we will need wind farms and solar parks in, in remote places in the world, but in, in countries where there is a combination, ideal combination of wind and sun. And then we will have to build ports in those countries to liquefy the sun and liquefy the wind and to export this to other places. Mm -hmm. And who will uh, transport those volumes of green ammonia and green methanol, for instance? Well, it's the shipping industry, and they can use it as a fuel in the meantime. What about uh, for you? Well, I, from a stand-up perspective, we actually started our uh, uh, sustainability journey already in 1989 by connecting our ships with the landshore connection. 2013, we did the first conversion with existing ship into methanol. And uh, the year after, we started a pilot with batteries on board the ship so we can maneuver in and out of the port to reduce the CO2 emissions, but also the sounds. So I think it's very much up to each and everybody here to actually be starting up, not waiting for the other ones, to dare to take the first step. It costs, but we have a responsibility there. But then I think to combine all those initiatives, and now not only talking about Stenauer, the shipping industry, but talking about the entire transportation and supply, mm -hmm. I think nobody can do it alone, but everybody can make it together in that case. And, and when I see, and, and there is a lot of frustration in us, where we see that um, there are willingness and there are a technology ready but the infrastructure, as Shaq said, right. the infrastructure is sure to make it available with green energy. That's the puzzle we are missing here. Because if we get that one, and we got Helen uh, um, investing in the small uh, developing countries, who actually are the one who are taking the big hit. They are not the big emissioner, but they are the one taking the big hit. Investing in the green um, uh, uh, infrastructure in the West means also that then we can avoid the discussion about uh, lost and damages. Because now all of a sudden we're trying to get so much money into lost and damages of the developing countries because the West continue living as, as we are. So I think the society needs to come together, invest in green infrastructure in West, to reduce the, the damages and losses in, in, in the poor countries, the developing countries, at the same time as we got the people who have the money close to their heart and want to make a better life here, then I think we start understanding. And then, as Minister also said, that countries actually do um, open up for businesses to dare to invest, to make that happen is extremely important from a governmental perspective because we are interested in doing those investments. I certainly applaud all your efforts and all your thinking. However, coming from an emerging economy myself, I think there is one thing a lot of people have in mind from our parts of the world, for example, uh, that um, what about some of the leapfrogs we are talking about here? Um, it is wonderful, the frogging of infrastructure, the frogging of technologies, but some of the very basic uh, 
needs in the developing countries, Mr. Minister knows this better than I do, are still need to be taken care of. So they have a lack of funding, uh, while at the same time they are fascinated by all these uh, uh, common shared goals that we are talking about here. Uh, so how to concentrate the resources to the right place, and there will be less waste of resources at the end of the day. And also to make sure the process would not be decades long, because people have, cannot just wait for uh, a, a better future. I think that is also a question we really need to bear in mind. Uh, I mean, Mr. Minister, correct me if I'm wrong. No, I completely agree. I, I, that's why, I mean, the funding, when there's uncertainty, it's hard to get that funding. And obviously, I think that the, the, the shipping industry, that in many cases also own ports, uh, are the ones that, that can help us lead the way. They, they know about their cost. We, we don't know about their cost structure. But, but talking you know, together, then the policies can be done in order to, to push that. In, in, in our case, and, and uh, I, to be blunt, we are still, uh, we passed a law recently on, on voluntary uh, carbon credits. Mm -hmm. But we are very concerned about trying to do it right and having you know good quality because it could be a way of funding some of these projects, uh, but also in the past uh, there has been mistakes on on the quality of them. So so it's the, the funding without a doubt is uh, very important, and we'll have to uh, we'll need support of multilaterals mm -hmm. and many other in order to to create that. Mm. Nicholas. As a business person, you are here to provide solutions. That's your daily job. So what about the questions uh, Mr. Minister just mentioned? No, but I think uh, I'm, I'm coming back. Uh, of course, that's, we need to take, we dare to take risks. I think that's extremely important. And, and there are some projects that we can't always focusing on the P&L to the bottom line every day to make life better. But I think I'm coming back to it's not just up to one part here. I think if with the willingness we see in the entire industry of supply chain, how we can actually capitalize on that willingness to open up more projects in those countries who are in the need of it. So, so the willingness is there. There are so many, um, many good examples when we see, for example, in, in the port of Gothenburg, we are together with Volvo Trucks and Scania cooperating in a electrified model for the future. And it's there. We want to do it, we can do it, but we don't have any electricity enough, which is green, to implement it. Mm. And there, of course, it's up to the government to start realize their part of this burden, if I, if I excuse my word. I like kicking the ball between the two uh -huh. of you. Uh, I like that. Uh, what about government preferential policy? Just briefly before I go no. to the other speakers, please, Mr. Minister. Well, um, again, I think uh, in, in our case, 82% uh, of, the, of the energy that we consumed last year uh, was renewable. Yes. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we are pushing very hard on that. Uh, and that's why we're, you know, also, you, you also need the, the firm capacity part, and, and, and that's why uh, by 2025, I'll give you an example, mm -hmm. uh, we won't have any contracts uh, on, on carbon or on bunker uh, generating electricity plants, okay? Uh, okay uh, our firm capacity, we're going to get, well, well, batteries and all that keeps improving, mm -hmm. Uh, we, we're betting on, on LNG, and that's why, you know, if we head that way, we believe we have something there. Uh, but, but if not, we, we, we have to uh, keep looking for ways of, of creating energy that we could use for also other means in order to have that capacity that's needed. Mm. Because you can have the technology, but if you don't have the energy, then mm -hmm. we, we cannot fix the solution. We have to think through. Helen, you want to take that ball? 
Um, so we, we had in, in uh, Glasgow the climate conference and uh, two years ago we had 24 countries that committed to supporting green shipping corridors. We have ones that are developing now between LA and Shanghai. Um, we've got ones, uh, one for mining companies between Australia and some, some ports in East Asia looking at using ammonia powered ships there. So we're starting to, to look at how to actually develop these. Mm -hmm. And again, it's something which I think can be very practical applying at a local level. But I mean, if you take LA, Shanghai, that's one of the busiest transport routes for freight, right, on, on the seas. So it's a very practical approach, getting all the right stakeholders in the room, making sure there's the energy sources, there's the solutions in terms of fuels, making sure we've got the right ships, we've got the, the buy-in and the demand, to be frank, um, from those who are doing the shipping, uh, who are shipping their products. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's really those partnerships and that leadership. But mm -hmm. One more thing on this, if I could, just uh, in terms of leadership, this is a moment where we have the climate crisis so much more stark. The, the Where we are now is so much worse than where scientists thought we would be at this stage. And it's, it's a very strong call here at Davos to wake up and to actually take the action we need. But also, if you look at shipping, for example, there's enormous effects on, on human health as well. 60,000 people die each year, it's estimated, from shipping fuel pollution, because it's a very heavy oil, very, very polluting fuel. So that is affecting people in different ports. So we have an opportunity here, and we've got an opportunity for leadership. We've seen, we've seen that from a number of shipping companies. Um, I'd mentioned Maersk as well, who back in 2018 set a net zero target for all of their shipping by 2050, and were very clear, they didn't know how they were gonna get there but they were big enough and they knew they could work with the manufacturers of the ships and with those who manufacture, uh, produce mm -hmm. the fuels to find the solutions. And since then, they've become even more ambitious. Jacques, any inspiration? Well, collective, uh, collective action is what we, what we need in a very complex and, 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 and very difficult uh, uh, supply chain. So collective action and leadership and, well, people and companies uh, uh, dare to, to, to pioneer and to invest. But uh, we have to do this together. And the, the big question is with global warming, what is the sense of urgency? What is the time frame that we have? Do we think we have decades or what is the time frame? What do because, you think? Well, I, I think as a European, we have as a continent uh, a green deal saying 2050 we want to be climate neutral. So that, that's a clear uh, 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 timeline. Mm -hmm. So then you have to do things. But the most in, in important thing, 2050 is 27 years from here. The more interesting is to know 2030, where are we? And that's if we want to reduce mm -hmm. the, the CO2 emissions in, by 2030, well, that's seven years from here. And then we have to do things right now without knowing if the technological option is the, the, the right one. So again, it's, it's pioneering and we need a coalition of the willing. And mm -hmm. I believe in yeah. seeing is believing and, and, and walk the talk. And as a port, we have a small fleet compared to the fleet of uh, Stena. Uh, it's a small fleet of tugboats. Yeah. And we will invest, and we, we did that, uh, and in a few weeks we will, we will inaugurate the first hydrogen tugboat in the world, which is the very first one. We will not solve the, the, the CO2 uh, problem of, uh, of the shipping industry, but as you, there are more than 20,000 tugboats in the world. If, and they, hopefully they will all come to Antwerp to see that very first hydrogen tugboat. Mm -hmm. And if you can show that it works, then hopefully we will be copied. Yes, please. No, just saying, just what we heard from, from the general uh, secretary here before, how important the trade is, and then comparing that 90% of all the goods in the world are traded on the sea yeah. with less than 3% of the emission, just to get some kind of dimension of the problem. But what's one of the road bumps here, what we see without getting the investments enough we see that administration and regulatory is also a very ba bad barrier for us to think on the transition itself. All of a sudden, we need to create more administration to actually live up to all contradictions with KPIs 
that are in the world right now. Mm -hmm. So make it simple because then it also will happen. So thank you so much, everyone on the stage and off the stage. We are looking forward to future cooperation. Thank you. Appreciate it.